<coughs> okay, I'm gonna see how this goes. Um, I really haven't studied at all for this. Um, so, if it's rough, bear with me. <laughs> okay, I call this, What Does Forgiveness of the Wicked Look Like? What's it look like? And I think we find an example of it in the book of James. And I'm going to read from James chapter 5, verses 5 to 8. Start at verse 5. Come, you rich people. Come now, you rich people. That's who James is talking to right now. I'll call them the elites. The ruling class. Weep aloud. You don't see narcs weep too often, do you? They'll weep over their money. Weep aloud and lament over the miseries that are coming your way. Your abundant wealth has rotted. And it's ruined. And your clothes, all of your clothes, are moth-eaten, full, full of holes and corrupt. Verse 3, your gold and your silver are completely rusted through. And their rust is a testimony. It's a testament against you. And that testimony against you will devour your flesh as if it were on fire. You have heaped together, you've gathered together treasures for the last days. In verse 4. But look. Check this out. Here's where these treasures have come from. This is why you are so abundantly wealthy. It's because of the wages that you have withheld by fraud from the workers who have worked your fields and reaped your fields crying out for vengeance, crying out not to forgive, no, for vengeance. And the cries of the harvesters, the cries of the workers, have come to the ears of the Lord of heavenly armies, to God. The cries of vengeance, the cries coming from the laborers and the reapers whose wages you have withheld by fraud, those cries have entered the ears of the Most High God. Cries for vengeance. Okay, in verse 5, James continues talking to the, uh, the rich. 
Here on earth, you have abandoned yourselves to soft living. Here on earth, you've abandoned yourself to the pleasures of self-indulgence and self-gratification. But what you've actually done, you have fattened your heart for the day of slaughter. You've condemned and have murdered. You know, we read not too long ago, a few days ago from 1 John, that he who hates, he who persecutes and abuses and misuses, one of, he's okay. It's okay. One of God's little ones. one of God's children whom he has adopted. That that's murder. The man who condemns one of God's innocent ones, I'm just quoting the scripture, commits murder. And that's a good word. Abuse, narcissistic abuse, particularly among those who are helpless and in a vulnerable position toward the the oppressor. A part of them has been murdered. A part of us was murdered. Okay, back to James, verse 6. You have condemned and have murdered the innocent man, even when he offered no resistance to you. There's your forgiveness right there. You know, I say this jokingly, but not so jokingly. If Actually, I haven't had too many opportunities to use this cute little phrase. And it, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong in saying this, but or thinking it. But if someone were to ask me, uh, you know, you, you need to forgive your parents who you haven't seen in so long. That's wrong. You need to you need to reestablish relations with those abusive people. You need to forgive them. My answer would be I already have. To which the inquisitor may ask, "Well, no, you haven't forgiven them. If you want nothing to do with them, you haven't forgiven them." And and this is where the cuteness would come in. But it is kind of how I feel. I would say, they're breathing, aren't they? (laughs) No, I forgave them. I'm not resisting them in any way. I'm not opposing anything they do. I'm not getting in the way of any of their purposes or plans or pursuits. I haven't committed any act of retribution toward them. I've just walked away from them. But I have done nothing actively to harm my abusers. I don't offer any, as we read in verse 6, no resistance. I haven't pressed charges for the things they did. I could. Okay, verse 6. You have condemned and have murdered the righteous, innocent man while he offers no resistance to you, yet you continue to murder and condemn. Wow, I just saw that right now. He uses that word condemn and murder in the same sentence, just like 1 John. 
just like John did when he said, if you condemn one of these little children, you commit murder. Condemns another way of saying shame. Okay, now in verse 7 of James, we read what James instructs his brothers, his family, the people he identifies with, the broken in spirit, the contrite in heart, the poor in spirit. Those are his brethren. Here's what he says, verse 7. Be patient. Be patient. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. We don't like to hear these words. Be patient. Wait. Wait till the coming of the Lord. Now he gives an example. Now see how a farmer or a husbandman waits expectantly. That's how James wants us to wait for the coming of the Lord with vengeance. Expectantly waiting. Waiting for his child to be born. That's absolutely right. Tony just said this is like uh, the husband waiting for his child to be born, you know, in the waiting room. And that's what they call the condition. The well, no, the condition of she's expecting. Yes. So, yeah, like the husband's waiting for his child to be born. And he's sitting in the waiting room. He's anxious, but he fully expects to, for that baby. He, he fully expects to be holding that baby in a matter of moments. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now see how the farmer keeps up his patient vigil. Patient vigil. Expectant vigil over the land until it receives the early and late rains. So you must also be patient. Now here's another instruction. Establish your heart. Strengthen and confirm your heart in final certainty. For the coming of the Lord is very near. Now I'm going to add this. When I read the coming of the Lord is near. Yes, it is talking about the great day of the Lord. The end of the world. But this is also referring to the delivering power of God to deliver you from the oppressor and the afflictor as you turn it over to Him. That's what forgiveness of the wicked looks like as well. You turn over that desire to pay them back to offer even a little resistance. No, forgiveness says, I'm turning this over to you and I fully expect you to protect me from them. Forgiveness is like 
going to your godfather. Yes, I'm speaking of the mafia. It, it's a left-handed illustration, but unfortunately, it's about the only illustration I can think of that involves the serious and gra seriousness and gravity of a blood covenant relationship. That's something to establish your heart in, that I have a blood covenant with God. He's my Godfather. And if you go to your Godfather, in the natural, in the, if you go to your Don, <laughs> and you have a problem, and you and your Don have maintained properly that relationship between you, uh, your Godfather's going to take care of business for you. quite handily. You've turned it over to him. All right, I'm going to read what John Gill wrote concerning James 5.8, which says, Establish your heart, strengthen and confirm your heart in the certainty that God, I'm going to rephrase this, that Elohim is your shield, is your protector, is your deliverer. This is John Gill. Be patient like a farmer. Establish your heart Fix your heart. This is, this is part of being patient as well. Make the decision to fix your heart on the everlasting love of God. That word everlasting love is a covenant word. Fix your heart on the loyalty that God has for you. Fix your mind on the covenant of grace. Be of good cheer. Do not be dismayed. Do not faint or sink under your pressures, but be of good courage. Pluck up your spirits. Lift up your heads, for the coming of Hashem is near. God himself, I'm reading John Gill, John, God himself <clears throat> will render tribulation to them that trouble you and free you from the source of your sorrows and the source of your afflictions. He's done it for me. It's kind of terrifying. He really is like the Godfather. He's no one to play with. And I'm speaking to those who oppress you and abuse you. I'm not talking to you. I'm I'm as if it's as if I'm speaking to the ones who have abused you. I say to them, he's no one to play with. The Lord of hosts. That word hosts means armies. Can I use the term muscle? God's muscle? If you knew what was coming, Mr. Narcissist, Mr. Narcissist Abuser, if you knew what was coming your way, you would be weeping 
and howling in misery. Your flesh would be consumed with terror and fire like these people we read of in the book of James. If you, if you really understood what's coming your way, Mr. Narcissist, And that is part of forgiving the wicked man who won't repent. We, we are, you are not. It is wrong to just forgive in the classic sense of the word. To forgive and reconcile and restore fellowship with anyone who refuses to repent of the wrongdoing they do toward you. And when I say repent, I don't mean just cry a good cry and promise you to do better next time. No, that, that's not repentance. Repentance means real, actual change of behavior over a prolonged period of time. Not a couple of weeks, not a couple of months, maybe a couple of years, maybe. A couple of years, maybe. Repentance implies restitution for all of the torture and the abuse they've inflicted on you. They work night and day to make it up to you. Now, how many of you have had that happen? I, I, it, it grieves my spirit how we have cheapened the act of forgiveness in the modern church. It means nothing. And I have to juxtapose that with the price. Now I'm going to speak in accordance with my own personal faith. And I have utmost respect for whatever faith you have. If, if, if you are a person of conscience, I mean this when I say this. You're my brother and sister if you follow your conscience. But I, I say that as a pretext to what I'm going to say now. This is how I this is my personal faith and religion. Christianity. Orthodox Christianity. Okay. But it's hard on my heart to juxtapose just I forgive everybody, no matter it doesn't matter if they repent or not. I forgive, forgive, forgive. I open myself up to anybody and everybody to juxtapose that or to compare that to the price that the Messiah, the Messiah paid being publicly shamed and humiliated and executed in the most horrific manner possible in order to purchase my forgiveness before God. A forgiveness before God which still required repentance on my part. But the price he paid in order to legally atone me of my depravity and my sin and my wickedness. And to, and to compare that to this mamby-pamby, candy-coated thing we call forgiveness. It's an abomination. It's an abomination. Forgiveness is not cheap. Forgiveness of the wicked is not cheap. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of hearing 
outstanding ministers even who who address these topics still cling to this idea that you got to forgive them. Now, what we need to do is grow in persistence and patience and perseverance and leave, leave the justice in the hands of, in, in the right hands, in the hands of our Father in heaven, our Godfather. We leave it up to him. And that is a form of forgiveness. It's just not the form that I was taught, at least, in church. Am I rambling? No. Okay. God him, I'm reading Gill again. God himself will render tribulation to those who trouble you. You know, there's a verse in the scripture, uh, I think it is in James, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let him resist them. Let God resist the wicked abuser in your life. Leave that to him. I can't think of anything more. Can you think of anything? Does this help clarify a little bit forgiveness? My, you know, my view of it. Your part is to turn the vengeance over to him. Don't resist I mean, and when I say that, if you have legal recourse to resist, by all means do it. If you can get away with it without it inflicting any further damage on your soul or well-being, I'm all for that, using legal means or what have you. Because some of these people really do need to be locked up. A whole lot of them do. Unfortunately, the entire society, it seems, we live in now needs to be locked up. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not much. This is Generation Narc. I did a bunch of videos on that a few years ago. Generation Narc. It's gotten exponentially worse since the times I made those videos. Yeah, we're the remnant. Let's be like those farmers we read about. Let's expectantly wait on the Lord, the Lord of hosts. I didn't say it was easy. James didn't say it was easy either. But we can do it. We have the grace to do it. God will give us the grace to do it. Do you believe that? I do. I do believe it. I do believe he's coming back. I do believe he's coming back to judge these wealthy, evil people who are running the show right now. Personally, I don't want to get into end time teaching or whatever now, but personally, I think we're going to see a judgment of the elite even before the Great Tribulation. And I think we're right on the heels of it. I'm hoping. Either way, it doesn't matter, though. I have my marching orders. I, I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier. A soldier's life is not easy. We 
when we hooked our name up to Yeshua's, I mean, I read this yesterday. You, you've got to, this is Yeshua telling his disciples, you got to love me more than your own kids, your own father, your own mother, even your own self. You have to be willing to die for me. And he's worth it. The Messiah, God, they're worth it. They're worth giving our lives for them, man. They are. They are. And he can be trusted. You can trust God to protect you from every weapon formed against you. You can trust him. No weapon formed against you will prosper if you will trust him. Amen. Amen.